Good morning, good morning. So good to see you this morning. Welcome to Calvary. We are blessed to have you. We have the greatest event in all of history that we gather together to celebrate today. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He defeated death. And for the Christian, we celebrate this day. For those of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ, it is giving us the ability to live the life that God designed us to live. And so that's, that, that, that's, that's a big thing. And so this morning, what I want to do I, I've been, we, all week long, we've gathered together kind of commemorating Holy Week on started last Sunday, all the way every night of the week, just kind of walking through the life of Jesus up into the cross, and then, of course, this morning, the resurrection. And I, I wanted to kind of continue that thought here, because the resurrection was kind of the, the icing on the cake. It was kind of the, the completion of, of everything Jesus had come to accomplish for us. And so what I wanted to do this morning is just kind of walk us through what impact the resurrection had upon the lives of those who uh, experienced um, that event. And so I, I, I want to I kind of walk us through that. Before we kind of look forward, let's look at the event at hand. We're going to read out of Matthew chapter 28. We're going to look at the second verse, but I, before we get there, I just want to kind of walk what had happened just prior to this. Jesus had been arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane. It was on the Mount of Olives. He was found guilty after a, a sham trial. We know a little bit about sham trials in our culture, don't we? <laughs> there, there was a sham trial that took place. There was false witnesses that were brought forth and they convicted Jesus of blasphemy as they took him to Pontius Pilate's house. They asked the Romans to finish the job because the Jews didn't have the authority to bring execution or the death penalty upon a prisoner. So they take Jesus to Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate wanted to let Jesus go. He saw that it was, it was all um, made up charges. And the people began to cry out, crucify him, crucify him. Pontius Pilate giving in to the crowds has Jesus handed over and he's flogged and he's crucified and placed in a tomb. As he was placed in that tomb, there were concerns that Jesus' body would be stolen, therefore giving validation to what he had claimed would happen. And so they put Roman guards outside the tomb. They put a seal, which would have been the Roman seal. It would have been a piece of clay kind of placed with a, 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 a signet ring on it that would anyone who would have broken that seal had the penalty of death coming upon him. And so the Roman guards there waiting. All four of the gospels tell us that the women were the ones who went to the tomb first. You women <laughs> had more courage than the men. <laughs> <laughs> women power, right? This, the women were there before the sun even came up. And they were looking to get Jesus' body and give him a proper burial. Little did they know as they get there, and they were talking about how are we going to get the stone away from here. Little did they know that the stone had already been rolled away. And the tomb was already empty. There was an angel there sitting on the tombstone waiting for the women. And we're going to pick that up in Matthew chapter 28 beginning in verse 2. It says, behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven. He came and he rolled back the stone from the door and he sat on it. Now, let me just say something at this point. Jesus 
didn't need the stone to be rolled away in order to get out. He was already out because he wasn't, he, he, was, he was in his glorified body and the stone couldn't even keep him inside the tomb, right? So just, just, just to note that. Look what it says in verse three. This angel's countenance was like lightning. His clothing is white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. The angel answered and he said to the woman, do not be afraid. For I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here for he is risen. And he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. Imagine the, the angels look. I, I know you're looking for Jesus. I know you, why you guys are here. But understand something. He's already gone. He's risen from the grave. The single most important event in all of history history was Jesus's resurrection. I like how C.S. Lewis in his book Miracles in 1947 he wrote this book and this is what C.S. Lewis wrote. The New Testament writers speak as if Christ's achievement in rising from the dead was the first event of its kind in the whole history of the universe. He is the first fruits, the pioneer of life. He was forced open a door that had been locked since the death of the first man. He has met, fought, and beaten the king of death. Everything is different because he's done so. This is the beginning of the new creation. A new chapter in cosmic history has been opened. I like that. What Jesus did that day changed the game. It was never the same. Jesus, for the first time, defeated death. The others had been resurrected, but then they died again. Jesus died, and he's alive forevermore. Never to taste death again. Now, that one event was the center of everything that the church stood for from that point forward. Every message that would be given would have a reference to the resurrection of Jesus Christ because it was the most important event. When Paul, when, I'm sorry, when Peter in Acts chapter two, the Holy Spirit had fallen upon the church and that day Peter begins to explain to them what had happened and I'm just going to read just a section of it it's in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22 it says this men of Israel hear these words Jesus of Nazareth a man attested by God to you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also know him being delivered by the determined purpose and the foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands and have crucified and you put him to death. And watch what it says. Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be held by it. I like that. He said, let me, let me tell you guys, you, you guys did what you did, but let me tell you, God did what he did. And he delivered Jesus from the grave that day. And death couldn't hold him down. It was a few days later, Peter and some of the apostles had made their way up to the temple. There was a man out begging. He was a lame man. And Peter says, look, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have in the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and walk. And this layman begins to walk. And as a result of it, a crowd begins to gather around Peter and the guys that were there. And what Peter begins to explain to them is found in Acts chapter 3 in the 13th verse now. Watch what he says. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murder to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God raised from the dead 
in which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has, been, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. You see, what, what, what Peter declared is, look, it's because of what Jesus did on that day this man stands before you whole. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. This man stands here healed. Life had been given. As a result of that message that Peter had given, the same people who had Jesus crucified arrest Peter. Now, now, now check this out. Acts chapter 4 verse 7. We're just kind of making our way through these different messages that were given. And, and I, I, want, I want you to take note with me here in Acts chapter 4, verse 7. They're actually questioning G, uh, uh, Peter about this message that they're proclaiming. Acts chapter 4, verse 7. When they had set them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have you done this? They're mad because the poor lame guy was healed. <laughs> and Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you and to the, all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by, his, by him this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which the Stone which was rejected by the builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Watch verse 12. I love this verse. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given amongst men by which you must be saved. Wow. They understood that what Jesus had accomplished was greater than any other accomplishment on the face of the earth and it was only by his name that salvation can come. There, there, you, you can't be saved by Muhammad. You can't be mis saved by Krishna. You can't be saved by any other religious leader, any other guru. The only one that can save you is Jesus Christ because he's the only one who died for you and proved that he paid for sins by raising from the dead. He's the one. And the apostles were bold to declare that. Even to the people that had Jesus crucified, they said, we don't care who you are. Let me tell you something. We're going to tell you that this is truth. There's no other name under heaven by which you must be saved. They get arrested a second time. They had threatened them and said, don't ever talk in his name again. You know, they, they let him go. Acts chapter 5, they're standing before the same group of guys. Verse 27, we're going to pick it up. When they had brought them, they set them before the council. The high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in his name? And look, you filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and tend to bring this man's blood on us. And Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. Him God has exalted to his right hand to be the prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and the forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were furious and they plotted to kill them. Wow. Do you think they thought this message was important? They were willing to die for it. They, they, they didn't care if it was the high priest and they didn't care if, you know, if it was, it was the, the beggar there at, at the gates. They were going to talk about Jesus who was raised from the dead that was able to forgive sins and able to transform lives. They saw it that important. Paul, the apostle, when he was in Antioch of Pisidia, now that, that's present day Turkey. He gives a message. 
and he kind of goes through the history of the nation of Israel, but we're going to jump down to verse 30 so for the sake of time. Watch what he says in verse 30. But God has raised him from the dead. He was seen for many days by those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem who are witnesses to the people. And we declare to you glad tidings, that promise which was made to the fathers. God has fulfilled this for us, their children, in that he raised up Jesus as it is written in the psalm, you are my son, today I have begotten you. You see, it wasn't just in Jerusalem, now it's going to the uttermost parts of the world. That same message, that Jesus defeated death that he defeated the grave, that he has power over death. And so that message that the apostles were preaching in the first century was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When Paul is writing to the Corinthians some 30, 40 years down the road, there in chapter 15, in the 20th verse, watch what he says here, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, but now Christ has risen from the dead. He's become the first fruit of all those who have fallen asleep. Watch this, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all shall be made alive. That's the message. In Adam all die. Guess what? We're all in Adam. That's talking about the human race, the first, the first man and the descendants that came out of that man. We all are in Adam. And because we're in Adam, we are a fallen people. We've sinned against God. We failed God. This position that you have in Adam is by default. Just because you were born, you're in Adam. And then he says, in Christ, you should be made alive. Now that's not a default. That's a position you obtain by faith. It's something that you have to embrace. It's something you have to declare. You have, you have to acknowledge, I, I am in Adam. I, I, I am destined for death eternal. But I don't want to remain in that position. I want to change my position. I want to be in Christ now. And the moment you're in Christ, your position is in him, then you pass from death to life. Your position changes. I think one of the best descriptions of that teaching or that doctrine is found in Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm going to ask you to turn there. If you've got your Bible, if you don't have a Bible, there is one underneath the seat in front of you. We don't want you to, to miss out. Ephesians chapter 2, there in the first verse and, and he, he, he uses the same language. I, that's why I, I think it's such a great parallel. It's there in Ephesians chapter two, verse one, he says, and you, he's talking to the Christian, to those who have changed their position to be in Christ and you, he made alive who were dead in your trespasses and in your sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world According to the prince of the power of the air, that's the devil. The same spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Among whom, and here, here's the catch. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves. In the lust of our flesh, the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature, just by default, children of wrath just like the others we were in the same boat we were in Adam we were guilty before God 
And then it's an interesting, the very next verse, verse four of Ephesians chapter two, it says, but God. Some of my favorite words in the Bible. Because every time you see but God, it means that man was doing something that was messed up, but God intervened. <laughs> and I don't know about you, that, that's like music to my ears. But God, watch this, who's rich in mercy because of his great love in which he loved us, even when you were dead in your trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. You've been raised up together, made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Jesus, for by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourself. Here it is. It's a gift of God. You see, God's given a gift. And that gift is that, is that you who were once far off, distant, there was a barrier between you and God as there was a barrier between me and God for many years. It's been rectified. It's been satisfied. In that he sent Jesus Christ to die on a cross. That was the payment. And then to raise from the grave the evidence that that payment was sufficient. And he did it for you. And you were once afar off. But now you can be made whole again. You can... Fulfill the very purpose you were created. As the spirit of God comes and lives inside of you. As he begins to transform you and change you and make you into the man or the woman that he created you to be. We're told in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 in the 14th verse it says, And God both raised up the Lord, check this out, and will also raise us up by his power. He says, Jesus was just the, the, the example. He was just the first fruits. He was just the evidence that what he did is also going to happen to you. Being resurrected. Romans 10, 9, it says this. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. We're told in Romans chapter 8. I love this verse. Verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Over and over. This idea that, that, that we're dead, but you can be alive. Just like D Jesus who died and was resurrected. That's the gift that God's offered us. It's available to everyone who asks. Everyone who comes to the same conclusion that's in agreement with God. God, I, I agree what you said is true. I am what you say I am and you are who you say you are. In the Gospel of John, I, I, and I think here, here's one, and I'm going to ask you to turn. We're, we're, we're making our way through these different references to the resurrection. But Jesus goes into some great detail in John chapter 5. This is before his resurrection, knowing what he was about to come to accomplish. And I like how Jesus explains it in John chapter 5 in verse 21, if you would join me there. John chapter 5, the 21st verse Jesus speaking, for as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one. He has committed all judgment to the son. That all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. 
Most assuredly I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. Now, when he's talking about the dead, he's talking about the spiritually dead, and God is going to bring his voice into the spiritually dead. Watch what he says. And those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this. The hour is coming in which all who are in their grave will hear his voice and come forth. Those who've done good to the resurrection of life and those who've done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. You see, Jesus was teaching about life eternal, everlasting. And one thing that he makes very clear is that you're going to live forever. I'm going to live forever. We, we are eternal beings. The only question that's got to be settled is where are you going to live forever at? You're either going to be with him or you're going to be separated from him. The choice is yours. You choose. God's given you the remedy. He's given the fix. He's given the answer to all of it. The only question is, what are you going to do with the answer? Or with the question? He says, there is a, there, there is a, a resurrection of life. And all of those who are in Christ, those who will put their faith in Christ, those who acknowledge that he's the savior of the world and those who've embraced him as their own Lord and savior, they're gonna rise up to the resurrection of life. Those who've rejected him and the offer of salvation that he's given you, you'll rise up to the resurrection of condemnation. That's what the Bible teaches. There's only two choices that man has. It's either for him or against him. And Jesus has provided the only, the only remedy there is to eternal life. And it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. I was reading a, a story, it was written by Robert Coleman. He wrote a book called Written in Blood. He tells a story of a boy his little sister needed a blood transfusion. The doctor explained that she had the same disease the boy had recovered from two years earlier. Her only chance for recovery was a transfusion from someone who had previously conquered the disease since the two children had the same rare blood type. The boy was the ideal donor. The doctor asked Johnny, would you give your blood to Mary? Little Johnny hesitated. His lower lip started to tremble. And then he smiled and he said, sure, for my sister, I will. Soon the two children were wheeled into the hospital room. Mary, pale and thin, Johnny, robust and healthy, neither spoke. But when their eyes met, Johnny grinned. As the nurse inserted the needle into his arm, Johnny's smile faded. He watched the blood flow through the tube. With the ordeal almost over, his voice slightly shaky, he broke the silence and he said, Doctor, when do I die? Only then did the doctor realize why Johnny had hesitated, why his lip had trembled when he had agreed to donate his blood, he thought giving his blood to his sister meant giving up his life. Guys, what you and I have is a fatal disease called sin. And the only remedy to fix that fatal disease was Jesus giving up his blood and his life. And he did it for you because he loves you. He paid the ultimate price because he loves you. And you can accept or you can reject. You can acknowledge 
I, I, need, I, I need to get right with God. He's, he's not asking you to join a church. He's not asking you to join a religion. He, he, he's just simply saying, I, I want to share with you in my victory. And if you're willing to acknowledge that you need me, I'll come in and I'll begin to live inside of you. I'll begin to change you. I'll begin to transform you. It's the choice that every human has to make. What are you gonna live your life for and who are you gonna live your life for? Jesus, one last reference here, and I, 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 think, I think it just summarizes all of it. He had had an encounter with Mary and Martha, that was Lazarus' sisters. They were just torn up because Lazarus had died. And they had come running to Jesus, threw, them, threw herself at the feet of Jesus, Mary did. And she said, Lord, if you were just here, my brother would be alive. And Jesus spoke to her and he said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the hope that we possess. You put your faith in Christ and you never die. You see, I, I, going through life, you, you, you have moments, you know, you, 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 my, my dad passed away some seven, eight years ago now. When, when, when you lose someone you care about and you love, you, 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 you start to see heaven as a different, in a different vantage point. You start to realize that one day I'm gonna see dad again. One day he's not gonna be sick. He's not gonna be hurting. He's, he's gonna be whole because he had put his faith in Jesus Christ. I got a little granddaughter that's got some medical issues and I just look at her little body and it just, I, I, I'm reminded one day she's gonna be healed. Now God can heal her while she's still here, but I'll tell you what, there's gonna be a day that all of this is done away with and we're in the presence of Almighty God. And this broken, fallen, falling apart world that we're living in is gonna be done away with. And I long for that day. And I know that day is coming. It may be sooner than we think, sooner than we expect, but it's coming. And our prayer, my prayer this morning, is that you would consider eternity that you would take eternity into account as we look at Jesus rising from the dead, defeating death. And if you believe in him, you'll never die. And the choice is yours. You get this opportunity to decide, man, am I willing to by faith ask Jesus Christ to cleanse me from my sin and to begin to live inside of me? And as we ask the team to come on up, we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna worship, we're gonna sing a song. And if this morning God is speaking to your heart, you realize, you know what, I, I, I need to get right with God. I need to ask him to forgive me my sins. I, I, need, to, I need to change my course this morning. I, I wanna invite you this morning to take that step of faith and ask Christ to come in and to be your Lord, and to be your Savior. Maybe you're here and you've kind of been kind of in and out, kind of wavering in this journey of faith, and today it's time to recommit your heart and to say, you know what, I, 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 need, I need to get back on track today. I need to put God back in the priority that he belongs in my life. I'm gonna invite you this morning to take a step 
and ask Christ to come and be the master of your life once again. And we're going to sing this chorus. We're going to, we're going to worship the Lord as God is speaking to you this morning. I invite you to come. I'm going to ask you to stand up right here in front of this platform, just right, right here in front. And you, by faith, declare, you know what? I, I, I need to ask God to come and live inside of me, bring life into this mortal body. Forgive me my sins and change my life. Someone's got those doors open. If you're in the foyer and God's speaking to you, you come too. But if you're sitting in the seats here, man, you know what? Just stand. Come. We want to pray with you. Decision you'll ever make is what you did with Jesus. This morning, man, if God is speaking to you, would you? Make that choice, take that step, and ask Christ to be your Lord and Savior. Let's worship together. Let's sing as God's speaking to your heart. God's speaking to you. Don't, don't hesitate. Don't wait. Just say, God, I give. I surrender. Come and live inside of me. Come. Come. God bless you guys. I hear the Savior say, and thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine holy and all. Is Jesus paid it all? And all to him I owe. And sin had left a crimson stain. He Jesus paid it all, and all to Him I go. Sin had left a crimson stain, He washed it white as snow. Just as we continue to worship, guys, I I, I know that this this is a a. a, a battle that takes place. It's spiritual what's happening right now. There's a war going on. It's for your soul. I just, I just want to encourage you, man. If you're still sitting in your seat and you're just going, man, I, 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 there's something tugging me. There's my heart pounding out of my chest. That, that's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is tr trying to draw you because he loves you. But God is a gentleman. He'll, he'll never force you. He's not going to give you an arm bar, make you tap out. You're not going to have to say uncle. He's, he just simply says, hey, I, I offered it to you. But you have to receive it. And you may be wrestling with that right now. It, it, it's, it's one of those things I, I remember in, over the years, I wrestled with it for years, you know, just knowing what was right, but not willing to surrender. I, wanted, I didn't want to give up my control to God. Let me tell you something, man. I do not regret a day of my life since I've done so. The best decision I ever made in my life was that day when I said, God, I give. I surrender. And you may be here, family, friends, you may be here with your husband or your wife and you're just waiting for them to go with you. This isn't between you and them. This is between you and him. You and him. It's not your boyfriend. It's not your girlfriend that's going to save you. It's not your husband or your wife. It's not your friends. It's Jesus, man. And if he's calling you, if he's nudging you, Humble yourself this morning and say, God, I, I give. I want to invite you to come and take over. We're going to sing that chorus one more time. I know there's some of you here that you're just, you're just battling. I invite you to take that step, surrender, and ask Christ to come and be your Lord. As we sing this chorus, would you, God speaks to you, would you come? Respond to what he's inviting you to.
Let's sing. Lord, now indeed I find Thy power in Thine alone Can change the leper spots And melt the heart of stone It's Jesus made and stain he washed in a white as snow is Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe sin had left a crimson stain he washed in a white as snow though my sin had left a crimson stain he washed in white as snow amen amen if there's anybody else man god speak into your heart guys i i i just know these moments are rare here's here's and i i tell you this from experience you see, you, you hear God knocking. You, you, you kind of know he's, he's, trying to, he's trying to draw me and then you put it off. Maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year and you just, you just begin to, just down the road, you, you, you just keep pushing it and here's the danger. It, it's, you, your heart becomes like a callus. It gets harder and harder and harder every time you reject God's offer for forgiveness. And at some point, you don't even feel it anymore. The Bible says that you get to the point that you're past feeling. That means that I, 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 don't, even, I don't even have that, that desire. I don't even have that urge. I don't even have that, that conviction any longer because I've just ignored it for so long. And now God's trying to convince you or prick you and it, you, you don't feel it any longer. If you're feeling it, if you know that, that, that God's trying to get me and I'm, I'm just fighting it, I'm resisting it, man, I, I, I plead with you. D don't wait another week, another day, another year. The Bible says today's the day of salvation. Today, God's trying to get your attention. That, that, that is a gift in itself but you have to receive it. I'm gonna ask David and the team to just to sing one more time. I believe there's some of you here that are just warring and, it, and it's a spiritual battle. I'm just gonna ask them, just that one chorus through, if you're still sitting in your seat and God is speaking to you, man, don't, don't, don't walk out of here the same person you walked in. Walk out a new person, alive in Christ Jesus. As we sing that chorus, just really, really quick. If you're still sitting in the foyer here in the sanctuary, man, we just want to give you that opportunity. Come. Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. The sin had left to come. Crimson stain, he washed in white as snow. This Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. But sin had left a crimson stain, he washed in white as my sin had left a crimson stain. Jesus washed in white as snow. Yes, he washed in white as snow. Jesus.
Jesus washed in white as snow. Amen. Amen. Anybody else, Mary? You know, you know what the Bible says? It says that the angels in heaven rejoice when one sinner repents. That, that's, that, that, that right there alone, man, brings joy to heaven. And if there's anyone else, man, we're, 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 gonna, we're gonna wrap this up, but if there's anyone else, and you're just, you're, you're there warring. I, I, I was there, I know, I, I wrestled with this decision for many, many, many years. We'll wait for you. Awesome. Awesome. We're going to pray, guys. We're, we're going to pray this simple prayer. And this, this, this is a prayer from your heart to God. Now, this, this is you doing business. I'm just going to help you through it. Would you join me as we pray? Dear God, I confess I'm a sinner. And I thank you that you're a savior. That you died that you rose and that you defeated death. And God, would you bring life into me? Lord, fill me with your spirit. Guide my steps, direct my path. I surrender to you, God. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys.